Good afternoon and welcome to our live stream Q&A today uh, on the film Well Wisdom. My name is Anna Blanco and I'm the Executive Director of the International Ocean Film Festival. And it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you here today. Uh, we're very excited to have this Q&A and we're very excited for our panelists and also for all of you who are able to join us on this live stream. As many of you know, we um, were supposed to host the film festival in March and we obviously had to um, postpone it to now and uh, it's given us an opportunity to do a lot of live stream Q&A such as this one. Um, all of our films are on online as part of the virtual film festival. And this is perhaps I think our eighth Q&A and we still have another six to go. Um, so they're being very well received from people around the world. It, it's truly an opportunity to um, meet people who are making an impact on our oceans and people who are helping us and fulfilling our mission, which is to save our oceans one film at a time. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, everyone. I'd like to start with um, introducing our moderator. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carl Safina, who is also a friend of the festival. Thank you, Carl, for being with us. Great pleasure to be with you. Carl is an award-winning author and ecologist and is the founding president of the Safina Center. Uh, which started in 2003 and is dedicated to the conservation of wild things and wild places. Um, Carl's been in many of the films that we've had here um, at the Ocean Film Festival, so I think a lot of our viewers will recognize you from that. He's also hosted the 10-part series on PBS Saving the Ocean with Carl Safina, which uh, is one of my favorites. Which Rick and Rosenthal was uh, one of our uh, camera people for. Exactly. And uh, Carl is joining us from the East Coast. So thank you, Carl, for being here. Sure thing. We also have Rick Rosenthal and uh, Katya, Sir, I'm going to pronounce your name poorly, Katya, my apologies. Um, but Rick and Katya are joining us from Santa Barbara. I had the pleasure of meeting both of them um, last October at the Jackson Wild Film Festival. Um, and Rick is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker, photographer in his own right, and Katya is the executive producer of Wild Logic LLC. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am going to leave the meeting and um, I will be uh, back towards the end and we welcome questions from our audience. Um, so please take advantage of this opportunity to um, ask questions about whale wisdom, about whales in general. And um, thank you all for, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so Katya, yes. why, don't we, why don't we get your last name on the record here? It's, <laughs> it's Shiraco, right? Is that how you say it? Just about, Shiraco. Oh, Shiraco, okay, great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Well, both of you have made a, a very interesting film that um, I would say uh, breaks some new water, uh, breaks some new ground in the, uh, in the area of animal behavior and animal cognition regarding, of course, the, the main subject, which is whales and whale wisdom. Um, I also want to just say at the outset that um, it takes a lot to make me jealous of anybody, but um, Rick, I'm pretty jealous of you. Oh, good. Uh, well, well, we have to fly fish again and see, see how we do on that river again. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, I have seen a lot of wild things in a lot of wild places, but um, you've been in the water with many of my very favorite and uh, totemic sorts of, of creatures, especially in this film with these, uh, um, with these whales. So as we all know, whales are just dumb masses of blubber, um, only good for oil that can be used for margarine. So why would you want to make a film about them and, and use the word wisdom? Well, that's, that's exactly why we wanted to make the film is that, uh, you know, years of, of 
being near those animals and, and swimming with them and filming them uh, and, and for a number of years with the BBC Natural History Unit, we were after the best behavior that we could get, but we weren't really linking a lot of those behaviors together. And uh, when Katya and I decided maybe it's time to do a film that, hey, whales are pretty smart and can we show it? I think that was the difficult thing because so many films you see a whale, it flukes up, it dives, and then there's a whole stream of, of narrative about how smart they are. Uh, we know it's difficult to, to follow them and uh, particular individuals. Um, and that, that the chore was, Carl, are they just operating by instinct or is there something else going on? And can they adapt? Can they learn? Uh, do they have some of the attributes that some of the high-end animals would have? Uh, the sensitivity, the, the, the ability to learn, to play, uh, to feel emotion, uh, all those things. And yeah, we were, we, were, we were pushing hard to try to find individuals. But I think the, the key thing is that you actually had a sense that there was a lot more going on, Rick did, uh, with whales but how to show it, how to prove it, how to convince our audience that what you felt in your gut based on filming whales over so many years was in fact the case. So you, you went to get um, these behaviors and essentially put them together uh, under you know, under this concept, it, it didn't just emerge in the course of the film and then you decided to call it wisdom. You, you, were, you, you had seen a number of behaviors that either, either intrigued you or convinced you the, uh, of what was going on. And, and in this film, you specifically went to get those on film. Is, was that the idea? That was the idea and, and you know, my, uh, way to operate has always been, Carl, to keep your eyes open because what you've got down on paper and what you're going for, sometimes something else will come up that's even better. And we certainly didn't expect things like to see gray whales surfing in Baja. Uh, we had a hint of that years ago, but uh, we really couldn't get close to them or have the tool to do that. So and when, let me interrupt you for one second. For some people may not have seen the film yet, Sure. What, what do you mean by surfing? Well, you know, surfing to us is catching a wave and, and more than just uh, to ride a wave into a bay or to go somewhere, but to then turn around and go back out again on the break and catch another wave. And, and because we had uh, drone technology with us, uh, drone camera, we could actually fly out over the bay at Magdalena Bay out where the waves were breaking. And it wasn't me, it was the drone pilots, uh, Eric Higuera from Mexico and uh, Mark Romanoff from Santa Barbara that were saying, you know, they're surfing. And- Oh, really? Oh, so, yeah. they, so they saw it from- They saw it. From their drone view. Right, and so they're watching the monitor and they're going, they're going back out again. There was five individual whales that we felt were males. There were no females around, no babies. And so they weren't showing off for them or coming in to, to say mate or whatever. That went on for a couple of days that they cruised back out again on the break. So some of those things are real eye openers. Now we had heard about, we can put up the first uh, frame grab slide if we can of the whale in Alaska. But, but let, me, let me just okay. add that, uh, so in, in answer to your question, so, did we did we come upon these by chance, or um, were these examples that we knew about and wanted to go out and film? So in the case of the gray whale surfing, and also here in Alaska, we had planned to film something entirely different, other smart behavior that um, we wanted to illustrate. But um, both in the case of the surfers. In, in Baja and this whale, which whale Rick will tell you about, it was um, just an amazing situation that we had not anticipated when we planned to make this film. So Carl, we started on this journey and for the audience, we started on this journey and we had 
we had uh, certainly some targets that we'd hope we might get uh, behavior on. And, and you know, I knew from my work in Alaska for years and from researchers telling me, there's a couple of whales that come up to this salmon hatchery every April, every spring when they're releasing baby salmon and the whales hang around and they're, they're causing a real problem for the hatchery because they're eating up, you know, tens of thousands or millions of baby salmon. And historically, you know, we've never reported humpback whales eating juvenile salmon. That's not in the literature that I've seen. And because no, their nature is such that when salmon leave a stream, the fresh water, they don't go out in big shoals. They leave in small groups or maybe at night. So maybe it's not, you know, worthwhile for a whale to chase them around where there's big shoals of herring out there that are, you know, high in food value. But one particular whale, and she showed up about the third day we were there and began to cruise around and look at the net pens and look over the situation. And, and it was almost like she had a map in her head. And, and, and we know, or we think that they don't echolocate like the tooth whales do. So something's going on with the humpbacks that they, maybe another sense, I don't know what that's about, but she would come into this big embayment and years ago, we'd worked there with the BBC and never saw this behavior. The hatchery wasn't there, but uh, this has been going on. And uh, the, the tool that we worked with a lot was a drone. So we didn't have to go follow the whale around or get close to her from, from a boat. Uh, we used the drone and Mark Romanoff flew that drone in places that we had just never dreamed we could see behavior before over the whale. So we're following an individual whale day after day, and we were never able to do that out in the big ocean at all. And that a lot of our films are composites of this whale and that whale, and they're all humpbacks, but this is the same individual. And the, um, the real surprise was, not only was she eating salmon that were coming out of the net pens or following their boats out where they were trying to release those salmon, but, the last day we were there, Mark and I were there and towards evening and we looked over at the net pens and these pens are 40 feet by 40 feet in terms of uh, dimensions. So they're not big, they're like a swimming pool. And the nets hang down about 20 feet and there's up to 7 million salmon or 2 million salmon in a, pool, in a pen. So there's a lot of protein in there. And that whale would cruise by and just look in that pen or cruising around. So we were looking across from the, uh, the wharf and the dock, and we saw almost like a Polaris missile coming up through the net pen. And, and she came into the pens that were, the net had been dropped, and we're saying she's in the pen. And they had made a decision to open one part of the net pen of the square to let the salmon come and go. And if there was a predator, they could go back in the pen and hide and whatever. So, I told Mark, we're gonna be up tomorrow morning early. And we kayaked over to the pen and barely got set up and I had a wetsuit on and Mark is filming. And she just came in there and just a huge bubble, just blew a giant bubble in there. We don't know what that means, whether I'm coming in, you know, look out, or she is herding, herding the, the salmon together in the group, uh, frightening them, so. When I got in the water and it's dark, it's dark water in Alaska, tannin stained. You can hardly see your swim fin. And I just was looking through the net figure. And she may swim by on the outside. And I just stayed there and she came into that net pen repeatedly. And that shot uh, is uh, pretty memorable. You know, something we never expected. She had figured out somehow uh, how to get what she wanted. And that was the, the salmon. So I've sometimes noticed that you can you can understand a lot or get new insights about what um, what an animal's mental capabilities are, a non-human animal, when they come into contact with a totally artificial situation, because among other things, they've never seen something like that before. And um, you know, if you had seen 
humpback whales feeding normally on schools of herring or, um, or you know, or something that they normally feed, sand eels or something like that. Right. Um, you would not be able to really have certain kinds of insights, uh, you know, insights about their ability to assess a new situation, to, to deal with changes in the situation, uh, how they were handling the nets, for instance. The, the idea that, that a humpback whale, which, you know, was, as you said, we don't think that they echolocate, how did it, how do you think it knew that the, that that um, boat was taking those salmon away from the hatchery. Um, that that surprised me. I would say more than anything because a humpback whales see. You know, I can imagine that they see the smolts in the net and that they see the net and they see an opening in the net. But how they could figure out that a boat that is leaving the hatchery is taking a million salmon with it? Um, that really surprised me. So, how do you think they were doing that? Any ideas? Well, this one whale, um, you know, she's been going there for several years. Now, we also have to back up, Carl. She doesn't live there. And that's what's even more impressive. It's not like her home ground. Uh, she's migrating there almost to the, the day or to the week when they release salmon. And this is driving the hatchery guys crazy because come April, she shows up. Now, the hatchery's running. or they, They've had the fish in the pens, but... but uh, around April, so she's come from Hawaii and made that journey, and she does a, you know, a beeline into there. Now, other humpbacks were out in front of the bay or neighboring bays feeding on herring. A few of them would come in and take a look uh, or make a swim by. Uh, in answer to your question, I don't know, you know, whether yeah. there's a better sense of smell than we've ever thought about, you know, with, uh, with whales. Olfaction was always a question mark, wasn't it? With uh, with with uh, yeah, baleen whales. Uh, eyesight is obviously keener than maybe we expect, or maybe there is some other sense that, that we just don't know about. Um, but I yeah. sense that that she's operating on on sensual cues that we don't understand. So Tom from Wales, uh, appropriate sounding place, uh -huh. uh, wants to know how much did your perspective of whale intelligence change whilst filming this film? And I, I, I guess that dovetails with uh, the question I was going to ask you next, which is, you know, what, what was your big takeaway? Um, those are two slightly different questions. You know, how did, how did it change? And, what was what was your big takeaway? Well, in each location, and to, to, to get the goodies for this film, we had to go to seven different locations. And uh, thank goodness it wasn't during a COVID uh, epidemic. We would never have been able to complete the film. Uh, we also were working with scientists that had expertise in some of those areas that helped us uh, a great deal. Uh, I think what I walked away with I took away, swam away with it. They're a heck of a lot smarter than we thought. And we've not even, you know, broken the surface to what's possible. Uh, the big difficulty, it's an aquatic animal and it, it's an open ocean animal most of the time. And it, we just can't stay with them. And we only get glimpses of them. Uh, imagine doing uh, human behavior and you just bust into the bathroom once a day and, you know, in a, Two minutes you see somebody in a bathtub and that's it and you have to uh, figure out you know what's their daily activity what are they about so i i'm even more blown away quote unquote, than i was before being around whales and to be with those big whales uh particular humpback sperm whales the more social whales we also went for ones that weren't as solitary uh that, that would make possibly express uh, behavioral traits that we could recognize. So re regarding the humpback in the net pen, Mary from California is interested in knowing whether they're eating differently because of changes in the available food. But, but I, I think what you're saying is that there were other humpbacks eating normally and this one just recognized a new situation that um, she could make work for her. 
Yeah, I think that's it because, you know, there was hundreds of humpbacks in the area or would be uh, as spring progressed. And she was just an individual. A year or two before, they actually took a houseboat down to another bay with pens, figuring that they would leave the bit major bay and hide this houseboat down in another bay with three or four pens that full of salmon. And they were going to really release them at night, at midnight, in the dark. And the aquarist uh, aquaculture people told me at 12 o'clock they opened the net pens, and at 12:10 the whales showed up. That's really, um, I would say that's amazing, and that um, that indicates a whole lot of other stuff going on with humpback whale brains than I ever suspected. Yeah, wow. We explored showing that uh, for technical reasons. It was uh, difficult to illustrate on film, but it's, it is an amazing. Technical reasons or because it was too dark? <laughs> we weren't there that, and we weren't there that, uh, uh -huh. that year. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an ongoing story. I don't think it's about climate change or change in food uh, dynamics up there. Um, certainly they're not making any more herring and the herring resource has been, you know, hit pretty hard over the years. That seems to be one of their preferred prey with the sand lance, sand eels and, and, and krill. But I guess if uh, those baby salmon are in those big shoals, you know, and, and you just go and scoop them up. Yeah. Uh, and the other whales seem to be maybe a little more frightened. The other thing that's amazing is, it's astounding is that they're moving the pens around. They're moving boats all around. Uh, we worried about her getting entangled, you know, getting tangled in the net. She had a lot of scars on her. Other yeah, whales. I saw that, yeah. So she's playing a dangerous game mm -hmm. in very shallow water. And when the tide goes out in Alaska, in big tides, um, there's very little water in it in there, right. uh, no, it's a big embayment. So she's just one of the uh, examples of, of uh, something exceptional going on. So exceptional suggests individuality. <clears throat> it also suggests that we just don't know a lot about what these different species are capable of doing. But um, what, what would you say about individuality from your work on this film is it is it generally uh, a, a new kind of thing that's impressed you is it is it important in the lives of whales and the evolution of their um you know social structures well i i would say that if especially long-lived animals long or, or whales social whales and family unit like sperm whales that those individuals that are exceptional may lead the pack and uh, matriarchal society, the female who's gathered this knowledge over the years and, and can adapt and uh, like elephants and, and find the food or stay out of danger or move when the water conditions aren't right or they're being harassed or whatever. So uh, again, I think we have to look at those those groups of animals that are more social and longer lived. What um, sperm whales are are really rather different from a lot of the other large whales. They're the only they're the only big whale with teeth. They have a very different kind of social organization. Hmm. Why don't you um, tell about your impressions of sperm about the clicks that you were hearing um, for the other people who are viewing, sperm whales have a social structure that is a lot like elephants. They live in female-led families, but um, they use patterns of clicks called codas by which they can uh, announce their, their selves as individuals and announce what family they are from and what clan their family belongs to. So uh, Rick, I, I was interested in knowing whether you could parse out the separate codas that those whales 
in the Azores were, um, were emitting when they were around you. I was in Dominica when I was working on my last book, which is called Becoming Wild. And uh, the scientist Shane Garrow could clearly hear the codas. I had to really struggle. Eventually I did kind of get it, but he was really um, you know, pointing out what to listen to and, and how to listen. I, I was hearing a lot of sound when I was watching the film. So what were your impressions of all of that? I'm not um, attuned to the codas enough to, to, and haven't listened enough to them. And we didn't have a sophisticated hydrophone. Uh, we were more directional, wanted to know where the whales might be as they disappeared from the surface. So for years, people like Hal Whitehead and, and Jonathan Gordon and Shane, blah, 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 uh, other people are really um, the masters at unlocking the language of sperm whales. So I was more of the um, photographer, uh, naturalist in that and curious about um, what we were seeing when the whales came up to the surface or shallow water. Uh, so my answer would be no, I'm not, I don't have the ear for it and, or the training. And I think that, that takes working with people that have been doing it for years uh, and Shane is on to some really good stuff uh, in Dominica. Um, we filmed in Dominica years ago when I did a sperm whale special, an Attenborough special. And, and uh, you know, we heard the clicks, and we heard all that, but I, I don't think anybody was aware at that time that they were um, that specific to different groups of whales. Mm -hmm. What Around what year was that? Uh, we were in Dominica in 1995. There were no whale watchers, none. And the government people, uh, the uh, researchers uh, had just started down there. So we went down there with Jonathan Gordon's group and Jonathan's at Oxford. Um, and that, that was an eye opener because the whales were pretty friendly. And, and that was, was a good thing. And uh, we had- I thought the, sperm whales eat people. Uh, and we, and we, also know, we also know from Moby Dick that they are fish. They're yeah. big fish, they're big blubbery fish. And there was what, a New England guy that slammed, he got swallowed by one and uh, they took him around to different carnivals and he was bleached. It was probably an albino or they dipped him in some bleach. Um, and, and he said he was spit out when they cut him open, remember the whale, they cut the whale open on the deck of the whaling ship and this guy spilled out on the deck and bleached white. And he then became a curiosity to, um, to at, uh, carnivals. Uh, Do you think that's a true story? Uh, I'm doubtful. <laughs> so I have been very I think close. The white bleaching sort of gives it away. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, you know, we've had different reports of people feeling those echolocations, those clicks uh, on your body. And I do know I've watched, and it's very rare to ever see two whales jaw fighting, sperm whales. And that was in the Azores. And we rowed up to the, we were rowing. And that's another thing that I wanted to mention is that a lot of our observations come from rowing or from kayaks. And, and that idea came from, uh, from the whaling boats uh, in the 1850s, 60s and stuff from a British surgeon that, that wrote a book. And- Thomas Beale. Beale, and they were rowing. I'm going, how is he getting all these observations and making these observations? They were rowing. So we made the decision way back, we weren't gonna sail up or motor up, we were going to row. And when we did that and rowed up to these groups of sperm whales, the behavior just opened up it was just like we had the key to the lock and open so tell up. us about that behavior because obviously that you know whales are are mammals of course and um and i was just kidding about all that stuff all, right. well all, all that stuff was what people used to think about them all, all the misconceptions and there there remain a lot of misconceptions but um through work such as yours and 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 such as this film we we now have tremendous insights into the true nature of whales so what what is what's your impression of their sociality with one another 
when you're actually there in person observing what they do with one another? Are they, are they sort of mechanical or are they, um, or are they very social? No, I think that, 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 just, that, that they're not, at least the sperm whales and those family groups. Uh, the, the, the big challenge is to not disturb them when they're socializing. And, and that was our approach is to quietly row up and or kayak up. And a lot of times we'll hide underneath the rowing boat, playable boat, or just swim with the kayak and get into position. They know we're there. Uh, they're echolocate, they're making a sound picture on us, but they're much more tolerant then. And when the, their babies and, and the females are, are there or uh, males come around, it might get aggressive. So uh, uh, I think the show is, is one of the greatest things on the planet. And to see that you're watching elephants in the sea. Well, the show, the show being the opposite of mechanical, they're very, sensual, rubbing, touching one another. I think that's what you're, you're uh, to address. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that to me was maybe the most surprising thing about them from, from what I knew. Um, and then what I came away with was just how very, very mammalian they are. They, they're constantly seeking physical contact with one another and greeting I mean, they actually, they don't look much like dogs, but they, they act a lot like dogs. They're, they're always rolling around with each other. The, the, uh, you know, they have those short looking pectoral flippers and yet they, they use them to, to touch each other. I mean, I, to me, that is just, uh, again, you know, that, that shows you that there's much, much more going on there than- you know, that, that, that you could, Sense, even if you didn't know much about whales, you could sense the affection and the, the tenderness that seemed to, they seem to be showing towards each other. Um, we wanted to share that with our audience. One of the things that, that Rick talked about, mentioned just now, which I wanted to um, uh, expand on a little bit was whale watchers. Um, so so we, we love that, um, that the, the uh, audience for the experience of whale watching is growing you know, rapidly. Um, at the same time, when we were in the Azores, we discovered that there were more than 30 different whale watching boats going out every single day wow. to observe the whales. And so it became a very big challenge for us. We didn't want to disturb the whale watchers. Uh, we didn't want them to be disturbing the whales. We were ultimately very lucky in the footage that we got, but it ended up being a kind of uh, difficult balance to appreciate the fact that people are appreciating our whales, our whales, but still manage to work without getting in their way or they're getting in ours. Well, Katya, as you know, there is a phrase called loving them to death. Mm -hmm. And um, there, is, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing one of the things that I never thought of before that Shane Garrow told me and was kind of a big, a big thing for him in Dominica is, um, and re, you know, regarding over there, not just whale watching, but, but swimming with sperm whales, they drop people in. He said, we don't respect their time and what they need to do with their time. And you know, here you have these creatures that spend about 50 minutes out of every hour, uh, way, way far from the surface. In those 10 minutes that they're at the surface, they have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And dodging people or deciding whether or not to alter course is something that is really not in their time and energy budget. And I, I have to say, I'm a little embarrassed to say, I, I never thought of that before, but I think that's kind of um, along the lines of what you're talking about. Right, and, and in, in fact, the behavior that was so surprising and wonderful that we captured of the youngsters playing with the ball, if, if there had been swimmers in the water right next to them, probably they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had a chance to play. And, and we see that a lot, Carl, when, when whale watching is important, and I, I understand that, but when it gets uh, so many boats, and, and maybe not all of them are, are 
proper etiquette. Um, you know, the, there's, the behavior changes, the whales leave, the, uh, stop whatever they're doing. So that's, that's a problem all over the world and, and whale watching is, is uh, and scientists are studying that right now to, to look at um, what those impacts are on those animals. And with, with us, it's a real challenge to do wildlife films now today in some of those areas because we're very restricted with our cameras and where we could work. So in the Azores, which is uh, fabulous islands, uh, really love going over there. We pioneered filming whales in the Azores and uh, there was only one whale watching group there in, uh, in 1995. The new permit said that we had to stay 12 miles off from the islands. Now that puts you out in the wind and at the mercy of the waves. And a lot of times there are not whales there. So we why, could- why, why 12 miles? I mean, that seems um, incomprehensible to me. Well, what, what that's telling is uh, telling us, and I know the people that issued to permits and they're great, but they got so much pressure from the whale watching industry that felt that camera crews were disturbing the whales. And that had happened in the past with a couple of crews, uh, camera crews, TV crews, which I won't mention their names right now, um, where they were doing things like putting critter cams on the whales and, uh, and chasing them around a bit. And it got to be a really volatile situation in, uh, in the Azores and the government got involved. And, and then so the new permits are, uh, they don't want you to really swim with them that often or to, um, uh, to, to get near the whale watching boats. Yeah. Well, the whale watching boats have Fijias, scouts, uh, uh, lookouts on the islands and they're looking out, they know where the whales are. We used to rely on them a lot. So we had to do pretty much freelance and, and go offshore and it was lucky one beautiful morning and um, we this group of whales we were following came up to the surface and and I kayaked and Mark Romanoff flew the drone over the top of the group and around and they that's one thing beautiful about the drone it, it doesn't disturb the whales like some other uh, camera that we might use from a boat or whatever it, it's it's not a threat to a whale. We could land on them with a, with a drone. And you could never see this play going on unless you were right over the top of them. And yeah, so, so talk a little bit more about just the uh, evolution of the technology that you've used over the course of your rather long and illustrious career. <laughs> um, and when when you love that you have some high tech and when you when you prefer the low tech? Well, first of all, we always dreamed about, because we get above, what, what bird's eye view could we do with the uh, open ocean animals? Whether it was schools of tunas and dolphins or uh, whales, um, you know, the most we could do is climb up on the mast of a boat, you know, on a sailing boat or something. And, and sometimes it gave us a good look uh, at least, but we knew a lot more was going on. And, and we flew airplanes, fixed wings and helicopters, but uh, over the top. But there again, you were maybe a thousand feet up or 500 feet up and, and you get glimpses and then you'd have to go back. But uh, there's a safety issue always. And here comes the commercial drone and then one drones that were available to the, uh, the cameraman and to the public. And if you have a good drone pilot who understands uh, filming and understands the animals and, and how to approach them. And, and we have that. And how to fly carefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and hopefully not dunk the, the uh, drone in the water because you're flying from a ship and trying to bring it back. But on that particular day, we were way offshore, nobody else out there and it was calm and the whales came up in a group and then they split up into two groups and um, then a, a small group converged and uh, the drone revealed what I couldn't see from the kayak. I could just see rolling around and, and stuff, passing around a ball-like object that was man-made. I don't believe it was a coconut with, with barnacles on it, probably off of a ship, maybe a buoy. 
And the remarkable thing is these whales have been down for say 40, 50 minutes in the dark and thousands of feet down to come up in bright sunlight and to be able to see that object on the surface and swim over to it, it wasn't right next to them. It wasn't food, nothing to do with food. Yeah. And then to begin to pass it around. Now, is that play? There's certainly, they were teething on it and, and they're chewing on it and passing it around. And, and that went on for several minutes. So make your own conclusion on what was going on. But uh, Well, it certainly looked to me like they were simply playing. I, I don't think I've ever heard of sperm whales playing, but right. um, you know, as we see more of, of all of these animals, we start to realize that they do a lot of things we didn't know about. And um, they've probably been doing that kind of thing for a long time. Exactly. Kachi, were you on most of these trips? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm jealous of both of you. Yeah. Lucky, yeah, lucky yeah. To be able Katya to has a difficult job of finding the money and, and to, to we can do these films. Um, we don't do them on spec. We go to the broadcasters and partners we work with in the past. And we were working with Terra Mater Factual in Vienna. And they gave us uh, the, the go ahead to uh, do this whale film. And um, we started in uh, the Cook Islands working with Nan Hauser, the researcher down there uh, on Humpback Whale Song. And why don't we put up that little song and maybe people can hear that song. It's on, uh, uh, what she, it's number seven. If we have a clip of that, that would be just a short clip. If Shannon can do that. Is the sound coming across? Oh, let's see here. We have any sound there, Carl? I can't hear that. I, I'm not hearing it. Okay. Yeah. There's no. There Here we go. So, so there, there, uh, we skipped ahead a little bit, but, but there's another tool that is used by researchers for years is the hydrophone and recordings are getting more sophisticated. And the great thing is that scientists are sharing those recordings. And when they began to share those recordings in the Pacific, and particularly in the South Pacific, Australia and uh, uh, Cook Islands, Tahiti, Caledonia, Tahiti, uh, Fiji, they then determined that by year's end, uh, a great deal of the whales were singing the same song, even though they didn't start off singing that. And it was seemed to be passing from Australia, going east. And, and that's a remarkable discovery that the sound wasn't traveling across the ocean like a blue whale song, but those songs are being passed on like a hit tune. And that really got us going on on this film when we listened to scientists and, and Nan Hauser's an old friend and I filmed down there uh, with her in the Cook Islands and uh, Jim Darling out in Hawaii uh, recordings. And that, you know, they're, they're really putting together an intriguing story now about humpback song and what it might mean and the evolution of it. So that was, that came from working with with a tool that um, scientists have used for years, the hydrophone. So, so that was another one that, uh, that added to our toolbox with the uh, drone. And then we use a kayak. And I think I have a shot just of a kayak uh, number four. Everybody knows what a kayak, but, but think back, uh, if we can put that up, Shannon, four. Think back that a kayak, uh, the, which the uh, Aleutian natives, the Aleuts used thousands years ago for hunting marine mammals. We're using a kayak today, and this is in Norway. I'm reluctant to go in the water there. <laughs> it's, it's a bit cold and uh, the northern lights, but it's another one of our tools that we feel are very passive and hopefully not disturbing the animals that much, and we can get in and out. And 
uh, the kayaks we're using, we can uh, snorkel next to and slide in the water. So we go from high tech drone cameras to low tech kayak and in between maybe the hydrophones and you know it's just uh, the evolution of what works for us and the other thing that's been very important in whale filming is the silent camera the digital cameras compared to our old film cameras because many times in the past when we were shooting in film and we had a big underwater housing and it's metal and the film is rolling off on, in that housing and that would frighten the animals and and i know that i first filmed sperm whale sleeping that had never been seen before and i was working with jonathan gordon in dominica the whales disappeared completely and they were close and he's listening he said rick i think the whales are there but i can't hear them nothing they've gone away so i got off the sailboat and started swimming and swimming and looking down and i see a whole group of them hanging down there about 20 feet down vertically like uh, redwood trees eyes closed and that was revelatory that that was an observation that we didn't expect and uh, when i'm free diving down to them and turned on the camera one of the whales i just opened like i see you and i kind of circled around them and took the shots and came up and when Jonathan and I were talking about that and his crew members were really excited because that was the first time that had ever been recorded that whales sleep underwater vertically and maybe a way to slip away to get away because the whalers recognize that too the, the commercial whalers that they just disappear and they didn't dive deep so here's this group on the surface you know a minute or two later they're gone and they're just hanging vertically so other photographers have filmed that, you know, more recently, but what a great opportunity to see that and now to have a quiet camera that when you turn on, the, you know, the go button, it's not making a, a vibration, a sound that would disturb the animal. So that's another, uh, another thing in our toolbox that's really good. So and can shoot. Go, going back to, um, you know, you're talking about not disturbing the animals. One, one of the viewers wants to know about the whale watching in Baja. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it's pretty well monitored, you know, as far as tourists and <clears throat> um, and what the what the hours are and what the off limit parts of the bay uh, are. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion about that? To, to me, it looks like it is very well managed and the whales have more of the choice they don't get chased around. What, what's your opinion? Katya was playing, she was not playing, she was a, a on-camera tourist in one of the boats and I, she can describe it. Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say that's true. That's an exception to the sort of love to death that we were seeing perhaps in other places. It seemed like overall the whales were making the, the whale mothers and their calves were making the decision to swim to us. Um, and the, uh, the, the Mexican um, operators were quite respectful. We were, you know, the engines were turned off and we would just wait. No, no boat was chasing after any whale. So that's a whole fascinating and absolutely thrilling experience. And I would say um, for any of the viewers in the audience, if you have a chance to have that experience, to have a wild animal, a wild whale come to you you're not feeding it, you're not giving it anything but a touch. It is a huge honor somehow. And Why would they do that? <laughs> yeah, I, I am, as I'm a business person, I'm not qualified to make any kind of scientific um, speculation, but I'll say from my gut that I think it must feel good. And I think uh, if you're, uh, spending so much time at sea and you don't rub up against too many things besides maybe your baby and your mate, it maybe just feels great to have someone give you a scratch around those barnacles that are stuck on your head. <laughs> so. it, it, and, and there's different bays there. And, and Carl, I think you worked up in, in uh, San Ignacio, yeah. uh, which we, we were there in the late 70s, early 80s. And that the whales were, there wasn't the whale watching uh, business in the, in the bay then the fishermen that, that worked there 
the families at first were frightened of the whales, you know, coming over the boats and uh, devilfish. Yeah, they had that reputation of being a, a dangerous whale and the whaling that went on there by the American whalers, killing so many whales and and uh, even the scientists at, when I was at Scripps in the 60s, they couldn't get close to gray whales very much. You know, that, that was that was difficult. But when we went to Magdalena Bay with our other cameraman, uh, Eric Hagera from La Paz, who's a fantastic cameraman himself, and uh, he's just recently filmed uh, the mating from the drone and underwater with a with a pole cam, and the whole you see the whole thing. It's fantastic, and on I think there's a shot of just from the surface on number three frame grab. You can see uh, the view that Eric was getting us. If Sharon, Shannon can put that up, and and here's the cluster of males around a female. It gets quite intense, and again that kind of a view that they're right directly over the whales and then to be able to put a camera underwater and see what's going on underwater. Um, again, it's a dream uh, to, for a biologist or for a cameraman. And uh, Eric has just filmed that and it's part of a new series we're doing called uh, Planet California. And uh, for, PBS. for PBS. And that's uh, giving us another look into the whales world. So we're, we're nearing the end here and um, some questions are starting to pile up. So we'll do a little lightning round of, of questions. Um, David Attenborough is, uh, is an older gentleman and uh, he's, uh, if, if anything, a little conservative. What, what did he have to say to you about your impressions that whales are thinking and uh, that there's a lot going on emotionally with them? Well, David, I've known him for years. I think he's the the real voice of conservation uh, in the world. He's been everywhere, and and yeah, he doesn't fly off on speculation. Uh, when he came in to do the narration, which he did fantastic at 94, 93 years old, I know no one that has that kind of ability, and. Um, when when he was leaving, I, I chatted with him a little bit, and we, we also had been over to his house. But he, I said, David, did we go too far? Did we push the envelope on this being anthropomorphic or you know some of these things? He says, No, Rick. He said, No one can get inside the whale's brain. I mean, who knows? He said, uh, It's fantastic, and away he went. So we did get a thumbs up from David, and I appreciate that a lot because he will not. He, he won't, won't go there. If he thinks it's an okay film, he says, oh, great, he's gone. You know, but he was really into it because he's been around and seen a lot of whales too. And uh, really appreciate from his perspective. Sebastian in Utah wants to know um, what you saw with whales and other marine mammals. Um, any, any interesting or unexpected things? Uh, with with other interactions with other uh, yeah, yes. mammals, yeah. Um, well, down in the Falkland Islands, when we're down there, and and that that's interactions with uh, orcas, killer whales, and uh, and elephant seals, and sea lions. That that's an ongoing story, and uh, uh, that is another interesting little side story. And when we got down there, uh, one of the key orcas had uh, had. Be stranded and had died. And it was an elephant seal hunter. And uh, was that whale stranded or was he just dying of some other thing? It looked, no, it looked it's stranded. It's really, stranded. It, did, it didn't look like he was having trouble moving away. It looked like he was weak. He was in too shallow water. And, and uh, he, he had six elephant seals in his stomach that he was regurgitating in the pressure on the on the beach that we didn't talk about that in the film. Wow. But well, he came in there very healthy and probably wow. made a mistake. Wow. Wow. And from the sand the, the, the underwater terrain had changed from sandstorms. And they had pushed him and tried and everything and could they not the people, right? You're yeah. talking about the people pushing him, trying to push yeah, him. Yeah, and could not get uh, enough going to get him into deeper water. But but his, did his companions, his whale companions, did they hang around until his death? 
Yes. Yes, they were there uh, even, the, the next, even the next morning. Uh -huh. And they died. So that, and then they left. And we saw, you know, a day or so later, Mark and I saw no more orcas and the lodge reported they didn't see any orcas for two months. So similar to what you describe in your book about orcas in uh, British Columbia in Alaska when there's a death uh, or an incident that uh, it's kind of a bad place or you go away or you leave. So, so whether that is, is like a, a funeral to us and, and uh, the emotion of that, it seemed like that was coming across. But would you agree that they know who they've lost and that they are very, very familiar with each other as individuals? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, with other marine mammals, you know, in other films, I, I, we didn't, you know, have dolphins around a lot. A lot of times you will, interactions with dolphins and, uh, you know, uh, several species of, of uh, you know, sea lions. Etc. So we didn't record anything we thought was going to add to this story at that time. One, one thing I've read about, um, I certainly have not seen this. I don't, I don't know if you have, but it's in my book, um, Beyond Words, is humpback whales in the Antarctic um, allowing seals that are being pursued by orcas to uh, you know, the, the seals will swim to the humpback whales and the humpbacks will sort of sweep them under a flipper and then roll over on their backs and lift the seal out of the water on their bellies. Uh, have you heard about that? I've heard of that and we've only seen the seals when they've come to our boat and hide underneath it when the orcas are circling in Alaska. And we've had- It seemed to... like they, were, they, would, they do occasionally apparently get an assist from humpback whales who know what's going on and um, you know, maybe they just want to deprive their their own predator of food. I mean, I think they they probably don't like uh, orcas because they threaten. Uh, you know, they sometimes kill humpbacks and and their um, you know the younger ones. Um, so they seem to know what's going on, and they seem to um, have a stake in thwarting the attack. Um, this leads Carl to to really that any of the young people out there or wanting to be marine biologists or cetacean researchers, boy, there's a lot we don't know. And it's gonna be, it's gonna always be that way in the ocean. And the ocean's getting, it's not any healthier right now. And we really are on a, a ticking time bomb, you know, in terms of keeping those habitats healthy. Uh, and, and the whales are certainly reflecting that. And but there's a lot more, I think your point is there's so much yeah. more to learn and uh, so whoever is, might be inspired or considering getting into marine biology, there's so much more to discover, to become, you know, to, to make a film about. Um, please, you know, the sciences and marine sciences especially need new blood and new smart people to, to, to join it. Yeah, you know, along those lines, in the 1950s, if you were studying elephants, you, you shot them, pulled their teeth out, to see how old they were. And then in the 1960s, in the early 60s, Ian Douglas Hamilton and Cynthia Moss started to get interested in why don't we just watch them and learn about their behavior and their emotional capacities and their family organization. And Jane Goodall did the same kind of thing with chimpanzees. These were, these were some of, George Schaller um, also with, with gorillas and lions. These were the first people to really get interested in the behavior of wild animals. And it's so recent that they're all still working. And you are still working. I'm still working. All this stuff is very, very new. And there is a lot, a lot left to find out about and discover. Every time you get a different angle on these whales, you see things you've never seen before. But the whales have probably been doing these kinds of things are capable of doing it for a very, very long time. Yeah. So we have run out of time. Speaking of a very long time, I would like to talk to you for a very long time, but, but we're out of time. And I wanna thank you very, very much. Uh, I wanna thank Anna and the festival. Shannon, thank you so much. Uh, the, the, the questions coming in, it worked out perfectly despite my earlier um, misgivings. Uh, <laughs>
about being too distracted by looking at my phone while I'm trying to look at the computer. Worked out beautifully. Thank you for that. Thank you, everybody who's joined us. And uh, I guess it's time to say good night on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Okay. We'll see you soon. Let's go someplace when we can go someplace. All right. We'll go someplace. Thank you, everybody. That was fantastic.